Muchas gracias, Tía, directora ejecutiva de Cota. Ahora vamos a proceder a la próxima participación de esta mañana, que está a cargo de Stephanie Schergen, vicepresidenta de operaciones de la Asociación de Comercio Orgánico, con el tema perspectiva del mercado orgánico norteamericano y su mirada respecto al mundo. Adelante. And we'll keep progressive slides. Ready? Move the slides. Okay. Uh, hello again. I am Stephanie Jerger, the Vice President of Operations for the Organic Trade Association in the United States. Again, we are established in 1985 and we are the unifying voice of organic in the U.S. I'm going to just present on some trends in the market uh, for organic for the US. Great, all right, so organic continues to be a bright spot in retail. Uh, right now, we can tell that the introduction of the USDA organic seal in the marketplace has captured growth since its establishment in 2002 when the seal became legal. Uh, right now, more than 80% of households purchase some form of organic, um, be that one or two products or several products. We can see the growth from 1990 when the Organic Food Productions Act um, got signed into law to when the seal began to be legal in 2002, and the growth has been exponential, up to $67 billion were recorded last year in organic sales in the US. So we can tell that we have captured a really big part of the market, even compared to in conventional, we're really small. It's still a lot of growth over the past 10 years. All right, so we wanna look at our market, um, their data review, we can still see that 90 plus percent of our organic sales are coming from food. Um, so that is everything edible, all the produce, dairy, eggs, but we still have a portion of our organic sales that comes from non-food, which is still substantial. It accounts to about $6 billion in our marketplace. And that is things that are vitamins, supplements, fiber, inputs, all these are categories of organic that people are purchasing still at a growing rate that we can tell over time. 
And also, if you look at the chart where we see the incremental growth, we can see that each year there is smaller, small growth, but still growth that is steadily growing over the past 10 years in organic um, with a peak in 2020. And that's largely, I'm sure, because of the uh, pandemic, health concerns, people not being able to get out. Um, and we did see a surge of internet purchases during that time. We wanna look at a little bit of the inflation impact because we have some interesting details that came from that information. If you look at the slide, the, the graph that talks about the index of food service versus off-premise consumption, what we're talking about is food service, which means service inside a building or a company or a hotel or a, uh, a convention center where people work and they get food in there versus leaving the premises to get food, uh, to find organic food somewhere else. And what we could really see is an increase in people being able to purchase organic food inside the buildings. So more places like hotels, casinos, workplaces are providing organic food and people are able to get them rather than having to leave a building to be able to get organic products. And that's pretty significant for us because right now we know that the most place, uh, the place where people buy the most organic product is in a supermarket. Uh, also, we did wanna also talk about the inflation piece. So the second graph shows how organic, even though we are growing and still not keeping up with inflation, you'll see inflation still peaking at 11 to 13, 15%, where organic in the blue chart below is not keeping up with the sales, but it's, almost impossible, um, but we do want to keep recording that trend so that we understand what the cost um, is, what the cost impact is doing, and how we're keeping up with the cost of inflation versus the cost of organic products. And I do want to highlight again, uh, over the past 10 years, we've doubled the size of organic in the U.S., uh, reaching $67 billion last year. And that's up a 4.3%, even with the cost of inflation, and we're still not keeping up. This is still a very good pace um, and a large growth sector for agriculture in the U.S., and we also also want to highlight the where it comes from, and you'll see that 35% still comes from produce, fruit, and vegetables, which is very significant, especially in the context of Seattle, because many of our mem the member states are people who import for us into the U.S. Uh, organic of fruits and vegetables. So we want to continue to highlight that uh, growth in Seattle members as growth partners for us in the U.S. All right, so the U.S. Uh, organic penetration of the food market. These slides indicate just a little bit differently about the one that I just showed. We want to show you the growth of each uh, item and each sector in there. And as you'll see, of course, fruits and vegetables, of course, continue to be the top, but they grew quite a bit, more, more than 3% in a year, um, which again, lends to the growth that we had, but also speaks to some trends that we're seeing towards people uh, moving more towards healthy options, less pesticides, no hormones, and organic really meeting that call for consumers in the U.S. Uh, also, we wanted to highlight um, dairy and eggs with uh, supply chain shortages and issues in conventional dairy and egg um, issues last year, people turned to organic quite often and we saw a big surge there for organic produced eggs. And the last on this page that I wanted to point out is condiments. Condiments have exponentially grown um, in the past year out of nowhere. And I think it is the more opportunity to uh, produce items that are in jars or have packaged packaging things that are maybe glass, better packaging preserves where condiments come in that gave us this opportunity. We have lots of theories about why, but we do want to highlight that because it's a really big jump from what we've seen. And so now we're looking more at the market of condiments, spices, sauces, um, and we're gonna pay closer attention to those. And many of those items as well come from uh, import places in the Americas for us.
All right. Uh, and then we want to talk about where our food, where people buy organic food. Again, we continue to see the place where people spend the most money and buy the most organic food is in large grocery retailers for us. It's mass market. Um, but we do want to highlight um, where we can see a, a difference in the second in the second frame. What you'll see is the people who are getting stuff, if you go all the way down to the bottom, convenience stores, that is something that has not really been seen. And even though it's a small jump, a jump of 1% in a market growth is a lot. And that's telling us that organic is showing up in a lot more places than it used to, even on corner stores, which was something almost unheard of for us. Also, I want to point to the regional natural health market food, and that's the third bar down on the second slide. That indicates for us that because it's going down is that people are not going to a specific natural or organic store anymore. They want to buy organic where they buy everything else that they're buying. So they're not wanting to go to a specific store. And that is evident by the, the club warehouse sales. So the big box stores where you can go buy your produce and your grocery and your paper goods and your child's toys. And people want to be able to buy organic in those places as well. And they're clearly showing us that they want to buy organic more places than just a specific store. And it also really speaks to the availability because sometimes organic, natural, and regional stores can be really local to an area. And if you're in a rural place, you cannot get to those kinds of stores. So the big box stores are really um, answering the call to be able to supply organic in those places as well. And it's really showing up in our research. Okay, well, we have surveys, of course, shopping, uh, surveying the American shopper. We do surveys uh, all over the country, including the Organic Trade Association. We have a consumer attitudes survey as well. But we ask shoppers, why are they buying organic? What about organic is making you purchase it? What drives you? Because we want to be able to know how to cultivate the market. We want to be able to let our producers and growers know what they need to do to keep attracting a shopper that will buy this product. And so we survey them on these top questions. And as you can see, these top answers are the reasons that American shoppers buy organic. And that's for one, that it's better for them. It's a healthier product. Uh, two, they're avoiding chemicals and pesticides, number two. Number three, they're avoiding processed food or overly processed food. And even though number four is not highlighted, it's still very important. It is better for the environment. And these are the things we continue to hear from American consumers about why they want organic and what will make them continue to purchase organic products. And organic in the U.S. is competing with ESG claims. Uh, I'm not sure what you call it in the Inter-Americas, but ESG claims for us are environmental, sustainable, and governance claims. These are claims that, that companies and businesses make about their corporate responsibility to the environment, to a social justice, to a greater good. And they claim that based on what their uh, what their product does. And you'll see other ESG uh, claims like non-GMO product. They have a claim, Regenerify, the Soil Climate Alliance, um, Rainforest Alliance. All of these represent an ESG claim that falls under either a social responsibility, some kind of social justice, a social need, um, like maybe uh, fair work pay, uh, work pay including women, those kinds of social things. Environment, of course, those are things like sustainability, protecting rainforest, reforestation, those kind of things. Non-GMO, without saying, it just means it's not genetically modified materials. And regenerative, which this is pretty new to the market, and we're still understanding the definition of regenerative, but it just means, as I understand it, the environment. Um, but organic competes really well in this organic usually falls under the sustainable, uh, the environment. 
It usually falls under the environmental ESG claim and the sustainability ESG claim. And you'll see that the top, <clears throat> that organic is at the top and the top reasons why, um, because the factors of the clean ingredients, which again speaks to the avoidance of pesticides, hormones, sprays, and then also it's free of synthetic and artificial agreements with um, uh, ingredients, I'm sorry, which speaks to the not genetically modified, no bioengineering and the lack of you know, robotics or technology in those places. So organic really sticks up to the ESG claims. And what we have found in America is that these are claims that consumers look for. They basically are putting their dollars to their values there and if people do not have these seals or these claims on their products, American buyers are less likely to purchase them if they're purchasing with that in mind. I did want to show a market uh, markup of a store. So this, this is an interesting graph. What it shows is how organic has penetrated US stores. This shows uh, 1,100 SKUs or categories in a retail market and what the claims are that they make. And you'll see that the big blue one, the blue one is where it, organic falls and that's it, it refers to environmental or sustainable. Uh, the purple refers to ESG claims that look at animal welfare. Uh, the green one shows social responsibility claims that a product is making. And the red one shows a sustainable packaging claim that uh, product is making. And as you'll see, organic is way out in front. It reaches the most SKUs, the most categories in the retail market and far exceeds what is available for all the other claims. So what this tells us is that organic can meet a lot of needs for a person who is being a conscious buyer. For someone who wants to just think about the environment, organic will meet that. For someone who just wants to think about sustainability of the country and, and its environment and its uh, region, U.S., uh, I'm not the U.S., the organic USDA seal says that to them. And that's what we're understanding by looking at data in this way, because we really do want to better understand what the market demands so that we can continue to meet that demand. And this was a very interesting, um, uh, a very interesting graph for us. And we wanted to be able to show you how uh, organic is penetrating the market in a retail way. All right. And then, of course, I want to give a little label refresher with just a little more detail, because this is what the consumers are seeing. This is what they understand about our label when they see the USDA seal. Uh, so for that USDA seal, 100 percent organic, it must contain 100 percent organic ingredients, not even the processing aids used to process it can be non-organic. So everything in that product has to be organic for the organic seal, that's 95%. 5% of the products in it by volume or by weight can be non-organic, but they must be on the national list. The national list is a list of items allowed by the USDA in organic production, and only 5% can be in that. For our made with category, Made with products cannot have the USDA seal, but they can say made with organic on the front label. And they must have 70% of uh, organic products with 30% allowable. And the last one is less than 70%. There is no limit to this item because these cannot be front labeled. They can only be listed in the ingredients. So if you have organic, organic sugar listed on there, but if the product does not meet the other three, you may not use the seal or the title. And this is how we're explaining this to consumers and trying to keep penetrating this information into the market so that people and consumers understand what it is they're purchasing. Okay, and then I want to keep looking at our organic consumers. Um, this is a survey that the USDA, I'm sorry, that uh, OTA did with the Edelman Trust. It's in two, 2021, um, but still very relevant information for us. Uh, we found that 71% of organic purchasing families have children. We have known for a while that children are an access and entry point. Usually from our research and data, when people have children, they begin to think about their food in a different way. They begin to think about what they're putting into their food and their children, and it usually leads them straight to us, to organic. 
right? 65% um, use organic packaged goods. So even processed goods are still uh, growing at a higher rate than conventional for us. And that's still a very good thing because packaged goods can also be frozen goods, which is a good uh, entity, a good place for us in the market. And then 62%, which is no surprise to us because again, children and milk are an entry point, use organic milk. Um, this is usually an access point for us and it still continues to be among the highest places that people and consumers buy organic. Of course, food and then dairy and eggs, as you saw on the other slides. And then we wanna keep heading, talking about the values, right? So our organic, lines with consumer values. You can clearly see that when we ask people over and over again, we get the same answers about why they're choosing organic. They're choosing organic because they don't want food with chemicals. They're choosing organic because of the treatment of the animals and the farm workers and the reasons, uh, the ways we document them. Um, they're choosing organic because of its environmental impact. And they're choosing organic because it's non-GMO, no genetic bioengineering or modifying of its ingredients. So they're buying a whole product. And for us, we're looking, trying to understand what the newer consumer is. That is the Gen Z. We have understood that we're going to need to understand what they need in order to continue growing the market because that's our new consumer. And for Gen Z, 76%, sustainability is the most important factor. Um, and then second, say animal welfare, which is really good news to us because in the US we just passed our organic livestock production standards, which tells us clearly how we treat animals and chickens and livestock on organic farms. And it gives much more clarity. It's, um, I don't know, maybe 10 years in the making, but we finally passed a very large um, and sustainable rule. So we're very proud about that. And this really gives us good insight that we're going in the correct direction by focusing on the welfare of the animals in production for organic. Okay, so we wanted to look a little bit at the import data because we think it's really important to talk about you know, the places that are growing our organic sales, but they're not produced in the US. And that continues to be many of these Inter-America's partners. Um, we really appreciate the work and the production that happens over here. And we wanted to show you just by volume, the amount uh, of a product that is coming in and being imported. And Mexico you know, continues to be on top, which is why a partnership with Canada is in place. We're working on something with them. Um, also the EU, of course, our partners in Canada, but Ecuador um, is on here as well. And, and they're a big player for us as well. Colombia, Argentina. And we wanted to continue to show that even though we have a large growth, our import is accounted in that growth. Those numbers are accounted here. So uh, the Inter-Americas are certainly represented in those sales. And for us, the export data, of course, we just wanna show you know where people are buying and where we're sending out organic uh, production the most. It continues to be a little bit different. It goes further out and further to, into Europe and to Asia. Um, and while we grow those markets, we would love to have um, uh, more in the Inter-Americas, but as you can clearly see, Dominican Republic still makes the list and we're very happy about that. We wanted to make sure that we highlight that as well. And a reminder, we just have seven agreements here of equivalency as um, my partner in Canada explained, our Canada review is up soon because it's never been reviewed. Although we've also had a really good relationship, we will continue to grow that and make sure that our standards and our language align. We are also uh, looking to get more arrangements where hopefully that we can also get something done with Mexico, that'd be really great. Um, but while we don't have that yet, we do have the seven in place that are strong um, and that are still going and they're still under equivalency right now. All right, and that is it. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, thank you for inviting the US to this event. Uh, I promise if you invite me back, I will present in Spanish next time. Mm -hmm.